Hello and welcome. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Annalisa, and this video is going to be all about Legendborn by Tracy Dion. I just finished this book, and I loved it a lot. And there's a lot of parts of it that I want to talk about, so I'm going to do a non-spoiler review section and then a spoilery discussion section. Firstly, star ratings are totally indicative of everything, but I would give this book five stars. I enjoyed it a great deal, and for me, there were no significant setbacks. What's it about? Our main character, Brie, has just lost her mother in a car accident. She is 16 years old, and just before her mother died, she signed up to be part of a program that allows you to get college classes and credit while still in high school. I actually did one of these in my own school, so that was fairly familiar to me, except my program was through a community college where there were no dorms, and so was a vastly different experience from the one that Brie jumps into. In addition to dorm life and college parties, Brie quickly finds out that something supernatural is going on at this school, that these supernatural things are very secret, and that knowing about it could get her in big trouble. From the synopsis and marking of the book, we know that this is a Camelot, Arthur and the Round Table oriented fantasy story. Specifically, it is a lot about the particular part of the Arthur myth. He is the once and future king, so after his initial reign in the 1600s, he is supposed to come again. At any time in the future from then, we don't know when. And I really enjoy the King Arthur stories. Um, my favorite one from when I was a kid is uh, Quest for Camelot, <laughs> which is a very weird movie with that's kind of a musical. Um, and I've always really loved musical movies. The weirdest part of it being a certain two-headed dragon, but it's a very cool story and it's all about unity and brotherhood and sisterhood and bravery and sacrifice and loyalty. And I love those elements. So I really like it when I can find a good retelling or one of these once in future happenings where we get a reincarnated or reborn Arthur character. So that is the very general, very beginning information. I'm going to go into stuff that happens a little further in the book, but not past halfway now. So if you're okay with a little information, but don't want um, last half spoilers, you can watch this part. <laughs> so because Brie was one of a fairly small number of students who were actually caught uh, fleeing from a clandestine college party at a cliffside, and then was one of the only women of color caught there. She ends up being one of, I believe, only two people um, who are assigned a babysitter, basically, who was an older student, uh, to follow them around and check in with them and make sure they're not up to no good. And I'll talk about that in a second, but first of all, very early on we see the racism that comes up against Brie and also her friend Alice as a cop who found them and several white people at the cliffside makes Brie and her Alice ride back with him in the squad car while he lets the white people go and then treats them really rudely in the car and then tells the Dean that Brie specifically was disrespectful when that's not what happened. And then we see throughout the book both microaggressions and rather large blatant aggressions against Brie by the white people around her, and Tracy Dion examines that a fair amount. Now about <laughs> sponsor, that's what those babysitters are called. Her sponsor turns out to be involved in a uh, secret society that is the descendants of the Knights of the Round Table, and their whole thing, other than reproducing so that the line goes on, which we'll also talk about in a moment, is to fight off Shadowborns, which are basically very demon-esque monsters who come through portals to feed off of humans, basically. And at the moment, they are in the process of choosing more people to bring in to their secret society to be little uh, foot soldiers to fight against these guys. And this is Bree's entrance into this group that she decides to join because she can see magic and once she sees the magic of this group, she has flashbacks and realizes that they used some magic on her before, back when her mother died. 
and she wanted to know what the heck that's about and did they have something to do with her mother's death. So now we get to talk about all the relationships that she makes when she joins this group because there is a large cast of characters in the secret society and I find them really interesting. You'll be glad to know that I have finally fixed lipstick that was on my teeth because black lipstick looks really good on your teeth. Anyway, the relationships. First we have Nick who is the sponsor who gets her involved with this group. He has been unassociated with this group for a long time because he didn't like them very much and didn't want to have anything to do with them, but he decides to rejoin them so that he can help Brie learn about what's going on with her mother. And one thing that I really like about Brie and about this story because of her is that she tells people things. Unlike a lot of YA characters, she doesn't feel the need to keep secrets for no reason. She tells Nick what's going on, why she wants to join this group to find out about her mother. And then throughout the story, she will hide things for a while, but when it becomes the right time to tell people things, she actually recognizes that and tells people things. And I appreciate that so much. So I really appreciate the openness between her and Nick and how she continues to tell him things that she discovers and they work together that way. And other interesting people she meets at this secret society are Greer, who is a non-binary character and is another one of the people competing to become a page, which is a type of foot soldier for this group. Um, we also have Witty, who is an old previous friend of Nick and is a genuinely kind person. And I really just, I like having <laughs> genuinely kind characters around. Um, another really interesting one is William, who is the healer. And I also really like archetypes of like questing slash warrior groups where you have strong men and um, mages and really fast people and um, skilled with a bow people and healers and so this story has a lot of those archetypes as far as people's fighting skills and William is wonderful. He also is a really good dispenser of information, a kind person, a dependable person who you can trust and you figure that out really quickly. And then there are more contentious relationships like one with Selwyn who is the Merlin which is uh, anyone who is a mag type for this group who because of her ability to see past his um, cloaking and memory defeating magic he believes Bree must be a bad guy who has powers because she is shadowborn in human shape um, and then we have Tor who is a blatantly racist uh, what are they called? Scion, which is one of the more upper echelons of power in this society. And it's probably because of the whole Knights of the Round Table thing, but I don't usually find stories, especially YA stories, where you have such a large group of good characters who are genuinely useful and um, non-contentious teammates, and I really like that dynamic. We also have at least two different forms of magic going on because we have the magic of the order with Merlins and with Scions where they have had magical powers from their ancestors who were members of the round table passed down to them and when they are awakened they get like super speed and super strength. And then we have Root which we discover from a friend of Bree's mother that comes in a different color. Um, because where you can see the colors of magic and which has a very different method of practice and I really liked how Tracy Dion juxtaposed those against each other showing their similarities and differences and that's one thing that wasn't fully explored in this book I felt like there were some things that the author like focused on it was like we're gonna look in depth at this like the character relationships and the politics of the order and then I felt like there were things that she was purposefully saying we're gonna look at this later <laughs> I'm just gonna give you the overview of this because the main character Brie is totally new to this and she doesn't understand and in the case of the Order's magic they don't actually understand it all that much either. Um, so it feels very much like that's something that's going to be explored in the next books because this is a series and so if you felt like the magic system didn't make much sense in this book that's valid um, but also I am hoping that 
that's intentional and that that will be um, addressed later on in the series. Another thing that this book looked at a lot is grief um, because of the loss of Bree's mother and she talks about it in her head quite a bit. She thinks about as a before and after. There's a before Brie and an after Brie where she feels like she is a different person and she is much more closed off and protecting herself and she has a lot more difficulty relating to people and her priorities are all shifted and she's generally just a bit of a mess. And she also deals with her grief by blocking it off very much so and refusing to think about her mother which I identify with a lot because I've had a couple of big, big experiences with grief maybe that other people wouldn't consider big but when my cats pass away I generally function by not thinking about them very much for at least a year and after that I am able to think about them more easily and focus on the happiness and not just the hurt um, and kind of the same thing happened when I lost my grandpa it's been two years now and now I'm more able to think about the happy times without feeling the pain a lot but it's, it's still a process um, so I really understand Bree's way of handling that why it's so difficult for her to confront those feelings and deal with them even though those feelings tend to need to be dealt with. Sometimes your mind isn't ready and it actually does need time in between the time that the thing happens and the time that you're able to process it. Okay, now we are going into the full spoilery section and discussion. So if you have read this book, I would love to know um, your thoughts and um, ideas about these subjects. And if you haven't read it but don't mind spoilers uh, and are wanting to get into the meat of the story, uh, feel free to stick around. So first of all, I don't know if this is a spoiler or not because it I could tell that this was going to happen before I even picked up the book. Like as soon as I heard that it was a Camelot rebirth situation and that there was a black girl on the cover and it was all about a black girl, I was like, cool, we get the second coming of Arthur as a black girl. That's obviously what this is about. It didn't happen until the very end and so I was like, is this a spoiler if I talk about this? Because it's like kind of the coolest thing. but. <laughs> Is it supposed to be a surprise or are we supposed to be like waiting for it with anticipation the whole time? I don't know. Like I like the setup and the way it was a surprise to the main character. I just am unable to tell if it's supposed to be a surprise to the reader. Like why would there be a story about Arthur's rebirth where the main character isn't Arthur? or Merlin. Like those are your two options <laughs> for main characters. Although I recognize in Quest for Camelot the the main character wasn't even close to Arthur but it also wasn't a rebirth situation. I don't know. Anyway I was really really happy with that and the whole concept and I was looking forward to it the whole book so that definitely enhanced my enjoyment um, and I was wondering like how she how the author was gonna manage that when she had all these other things set up but I, I was kind of also expecting it to be like well obviously at some point there was a woman or someone deemed unacceptable to be the heir and they were like unsuccessful in killing her and she went off and had kids and that's the actual line and they just pretended that this second born child who was more accept acceptable was the line so a bit different from what actually happened but like I was making theories the whole time and that was also part of the fun. Other things that I really enjoyed uh, that were fairly far into the book are like the training montage. It wasn't a totally classic predictable training montage and I liked that aspect of it. We got to see a kind of reasonable way that she would have learned these skills so fast although one difficulty with that is that you cannot build muscle very fast. It The nature of building muscle is that you have to tear it up in order for it to build back and if you work out back-to-back -back days repeatedly you that won't work <laughs> you'll you you if you re-tear it up before it grows it, it doesn't work so like you can learn skills that fast if you intensely train but you cannot grow muscles that fast so and you, you will actually injure yourself and make you unable to fight if you do it that fast so that was a little bit questionable for me and I would have liked it more if they had like 
if the author had left it a bit more spread out like it was originally intended to be at six weeks it would have made more sense I think she could have just summarized things and kept the pacing fast it didn't have to actually canonically take place over two weeks in order for the pacing to be quick enough although if that was a method that the leaders were trying to use to make it impossible for Bree to succeed that would make sense if it was taken more in accordance with yeah you can't grow muscles that fast rather than yeah you can't gain skills that fast and if you work your muscles that hard back to back you will not be in any condition to fight in a competition at the end of the week but I want to address again how much I enjoyed Bree telling people things like she told Nick everything and then the only reason she didn't at various points were because he was fully unavailable. She also info dumped to Cell and she info dumped to Alice and she info dumped to the two root workers. Like she told all these people everything they needed to know so they would be willing to help her and she didn't hold it back because she would worry she was worried about judgment or letting secrets go. And I was so pleased with that. That was such a breath of fresh air and really reinforced my liking of her character. Another discussion that Tracy Dion brought up is the eugenics and breeding discussion where it's made clear that the line of the knights has not evolved naturally. It's There's been some forbidden romances that aren't allowed because it will mess things up. And that makes me think there have also been a lot of arranged marriage type situations. Um, and definitely these people haven't all stayed white without intending to do so. And they probably haven't stayed all not disabled without intending to do so. They probably did that on purpose with some lovely eugenics. And I really liked that the author brought that up instead of just, oh yeah, these people all are white able-bodied people um naturally and that's just naturally what the descendants of the knights of the round table would look like no not natural where's the tail Ooh, there's the tail <laughs> another interesting aspect is the whole bonding thing where a scion will be bonded with a squire which is like a uh hi there there she is a promoted page and how they like feel each other's feelings to an extent and get like extra loyal and devoted and feel really really bad um if they if one of them loses the other and there are i think at least two couples who are assigned and their squire and so i was wondering what kind of power dynamic that would create because the sign outranks the squire um and it sounds like because of the emotional link and so far the science being generally good people except Tor of course they don't have an unhealthy power dynamic over their squire but it's really easy to see how that could happen especially with the competition to become a squire how people might develop a relationship first and then be like sort of buy their way into being a squire via that relationship and how one is kind of the protector of the other and while I really like bodyguard romances uh, I recognize that there's a definite weird power dynamic there um, and we didn't really see that explored in this book and so I'm hoping that in the next book that will be um, more explored along with the magic system oh also about the romance is um, <laughs> I also saw the whole Selwyn thing coming basically by what comes up a lot in YA which is whichever character is the nastiest to the main character is the one they're supposed to end up with which is not my favorite trope I don't like enemies to lovers actually because in my opinion it's rarely all that well done <laughs> in this case it actually is really well done in my opinion um, I was just kind of irritated that the very beginning that I was able to like yeah I see where this is going and while I do like looking at relationships where they seem really great at first because you got rose tinted glasses and um, you haven't you've had really unhealthy relationships before or no relationships before and so you get into a really deep relationship with someone who's not quite as wonderful as they seem aka Nick in this story and Tamlin in other stories um, <laughs> Uh, while I like examining that, it is also kind of frustrating to get 
um, involved in a relationship and then have it deteriorate. While I know that's a real thing in real life, it's annoying to read in my fantasy life. It really felt like a breath of fresh air when she first got involved with Nick because he's such a genuinely nice person and it's been such a long time since I've read a YA book where the love interest was a genuinely nice person and yeah being able to see from the beginning that that was gonna not work out just because he was a nice person was irritating. In this case I think both of those tropes were well done. Um, they weren't lazily done, they didn't just follow along with the trope, reasons were actually given and explained and explored, and so I appreciate that. <laughs> I just would like to find a YA book that does things a little uh, differently in that area. So, my hopes for the next book include exploration of the magic system, the bond system, finding out more about Nick and how he's gonna handle the whole Lancelot thing, and exploring Alice's place in all of this because she has found out about the order but she's not an official member and how are they gonna handle that and how she's gonna handle that and also of course how the whole society as a whole is going to react to Brie being Arthur and how Brie herself is going to react to that actually. So I'm really looking forward to the next book. I wish it wasn't so far off. I wish we had a title or a specific <laughs> publication date. And I'm also kind of glad that I waited like six months to read it, so I have less long to wait to the next one. Um, but yeah, I adored this story. <sighs> I hope that you have too, or that you will. And if there is a wizard, how about that for today's video's emoji, or a fireball if you can't find a wizard. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!